Five score years ago, a great American in whose symbolic shadow we stand today signed the Emancipation Proclamation. This momentous decree came as a great beacon light of hope to millions of Negro slaves who had been seared in the flames of withering injustice. It came as a joyous daybreak to end the long night of their captivity. But 100 years later, the Negro still is not free. 100 years later, the life of the Negro is still sadly crippled by the manacles of segregation and the chains of discrimination. One hundred years later, the Negro lives on a lonely island of poverty in the midst of a vast ocean of material prosperity. One hundred years later, The Negro is still languished in the corners of American society and finds himself in exile in his own land. And so we've come here today to dramatize a shameful condition. In a sense, we've come to our nation's capital to cash a check. When the architects of our republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. They were signing a promissory note to which every American was to fall heir. This note was a promise that all men, yes, black men as well as white men, would be guaranteed the unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It is obvious today that America has defaulted on this promissory note insofar as her citizens of color are concerned. Instead of honoring this sacred obligation, America has given the Negro people a bad check, a check which has come back marked insufficient funds. But we refuse to believe that the Bank of Justice is bankrupt. We refuse to believe that there are insufficient funds in the great vaults of opportunity of this nation. And so we've come to cash this check, a check that will give us upon demand the riches of freedom and the security of justice. We have also come to this hallowed spot to remind America of the fierce urgency of now. This is no time to engage in the luxury of cooling off or to take the tranquilizing drug of gradualism. Now is the time to make real the promises of democracy. Now is the time to rise from the dark and desolate valley of segregation to the sunlit path of racial justice. Now is the time <laughs> to lift our nation from the quicksands of racial injustice to the solid rock of brotherhood. Now is the time. To make justice a reality for all of God's children. It would be fatal for the nation to overlook the urgency of the moment, this sweltering summer of the Negro's legitimate discontent, 
will not pass until there is an invigorating autumn of freedom and equality. 1963 is not an end, but a beginning. Those who hope that the Negro needed to blow off steam and will now be content will have a rude awakening if the nation returns to business as usual. Good evening. Uh, my name is Clarence Anthony. I'm the CEO and Executive Director of the National League of Cities. Uh, welcome to the National Black Caucus of Local Elected Officials uh, Reclaiming the Dream Initiative launch tonight. Tonight is going to be an amazing conversation because it's a conversation that introduces the initiative, but also focus on the role of philanthropy, foundations in Black communities. You know, NBC Leo uh, was founded and they're celebrating our year, our 50 years of representing leaders in local governments in reflecting on the black community in terms of the strides the black community has made, but also some of the challenges that are facing uh, the black community, the disparities in and in other areas. This fireside chat is focused on discussing not just the disparities, but what local government leaders will also highlight and the tools that they will need, the resources that they will need and leverage locally to combat those uh, disparities. And I think that that's the important role of NBC Leo is to make sure that the black community, to make sure the black leaders that are members of NBC Leo have those tools to address those disparities. You know, it is February and every year in our country, we commemorate and celebrate the accomplishments of black people. And we are reminded of the many stories of the familiar legends and the icons in our community, not in other communities, but in our communities, the inventors, the engineers, the geniuses, and of course, the civil rights heroes. And I often say that uh, black history is America's history because without those inventions, without those engineers, without the, the backbone and the foundation that the black community has provided in our nation, uh, America wouldn't be America. The history of our country proves that, you know, African Americans have been the most ardent believers of the potential of America. And today, as a part of our conversation, we will examine how the powerful speech of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. that summer in 1963 is being reflected in our community or not. I think that's a good question too. And how as municipal leaders, we can do our part to push our country as we rebuild from this pandemic to pursue what we call the American dream, to pursue equity and to build more inclusive community. Because we know that there's work to be done and we know that black elected officials, black business people, black phil philanthropy will be a part of that response in our nation. So tonight or today, uh, we have two outstanding speakers this evening. And I, I just wanna take a few minutes to introduce them. Uh, we have Susan Taylor Batten, uh, who is the president and chief executive officer of the ABFE. It's a philanthropic partnership of uh, black communities. It's a uh, it's the organization that consists of uh, the Black Foundation executives. And it was established in 1971 and is a membership-based uh, phil philanthropic organization, boy, that word, philanthropic organization that advocates uh, for responsive and transformative investments in Black communities. 
She came to ABFE after more than 25 years of leadership experience in both the private and public sectors. Prior to joining ABFE, um, Susan served as a senior associate with the Annie E. Casey Foundation, who's a great partner of the National League of Cities. She also worked as a senior analyst with the US Department of Agriculture, conducting research and evaluation on food assistance program. Thank you, Susan, for being here. We also have Russell Neal Jr., uh, who's a council person for the fourth ward in Akron, Ohio, and president of the National League of Cities National Black Caucus of Local Elected Officials. He was elected in office in 2009 and chairs the Parks and Recreation Committee and serves on the Planning and Health and Social Services Committee for the city. His affiliations include founder and president of the Butchtel High School Alumni Association. You know, I got a chance to interview uh, Russell last week, uh, and I'll tell you, he's an entrepreneur. Um, he is a leader in his community. He also just is a committed uh, person who is committed to the work of lifting up uh, communities of color all over America, but specifically in his city. So we have a great conversation lined up tonight, and I know that is going to be one that we're going to walk away inspired and ready uh, to continue to change our communities nationally. So let me get the conversation started. And uh, I'm going to start with our president, um, Russell. And I'm going to ask you a couple of questions, but who knows where this conversation will go, Susan, as well as Russell, because I think a good conversation just goes. So if y'all want to go in a different direction, just say, you know, I want to talk about this and I'll go right with you all because I just I just want to have a conversation because this is such a, a great month. So Russell, I'm going to start with you, though. Now, we all heard Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech, and we've heard it so many times, but there's something that we pull out of that speech every time because it's such a powerful message. Tell us about the inspiration uh, for this initiative, uh, Reclaiming the Dream, uh, that NBC Leo is kicking off this year. Well, thanks, Brother Anthony. And first, I just want to say thanks to you. Thanks to NOC. And on behalf of the NBC Leo family, and I, I just want to give homage to those who started this organization some 50 years ago, um, 51 years ago now. Um, so thank you. Uh, really, you know, uh, the inspiration came from a couple of things. One was uh, the work of real, uh, the race equity and uh, leadership council and being able to to sit uh, amongst peers and colleagues and and just learn and, and, and get a better understanding of how to wrap my mind around this this whole experience that we've had here of, of racial disparity um, and then you know I go back to where real was started and you struggle with it with Michael with Brown with Michael Brown you know being the new CEO of of NLC, you didn't want to start off with race, but thank God you all took that step because it, it, it prepared us for where we are now. So many years later, we had George Floyd. And, and it was at that time when, you know, people were asking, what has changed? And of course, coming into this period of time now, I always, me personally, I always reflect on the work of Dr. King. And usually when we look at the I Have a Dream speech, we think of, you know, I have a dream, my children holding hands with others, rarely do we focus on that first part. And when I read the, the first part of the speech and listened to it, it let me know not, not that much had changed. But thank God to the experience of learning how to look at this through, a new, through new eyes, a racial equities lens, I understood how we could now achieve that, that dream that Dr. King had spoke of. So, you know, um, I'm, I'm happy to, uh, that we're having this conversation today. Uh, as NBC Leo has um, five initiatives that we're looking at uh, through this racial equity lens, criminal justice reform, uh, education on equity in government, meaning we want to educate folks so that we can 
normalize this conversation. Across the country, we're talking about institutional racism, uh, racial equity, equality, you know, but what does that mean? Uh, we've got to have a common understanding. Uh, and so that's one of our initiatives, work skill development, uh, community equi equity funds and philanthropic foundations and homelessness. And so tonight, I'm, again, I'm, I'm thankful that we can look at the philanthropic and community equity funds because I believe this is key to us sustaining our work because, you know, you can't, every time we get ready to do something, what do we ask? How are we going to fund it? How are we going to sustain it? So thank you for this, this opportunity to have this conversation today. Now, uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, President Neal. And I, I must say that it is, in fact, an important time to have this conversation. And, uh, you know, one of the things that you, you talk about is an idea is an idea, but to having funding uh, for it is important. And that's where Susan comes in to us and as a part of this conversation. But, you know, I before we, we talk about funding, and, and uh, I do want do want to have this opportunity for you to tell us a little bit about ABFE and the work that ABFE is doing. But, you know, I also um, also talked about how I connect to that speech. Uh, every time I hear it, there's something I hear over these, I want to tell you how old I am. But um, tell me, what what uh, connects with you in that speech and how does it connect to what you do every day? How does that, that connection occur? Yeah, well, thank you so much, Clarence, for inviting me and Russell, thank you for the opportunity to introduce AppFeed to your network um, and to figure out how we work closer together uh, around our common, our common goals. Um, this was a great opportunity to look back at the speech uh, because uh, you know people can coin the the typical phrases, but I'll have to say, and I had to sort of write it down, Clarence. Um, there's a there's a line in the speech: uh, "There will be neither rest nor tranquility in America until the Negro is granted citizenship rights." And to me, it just speaks to the the movement, the, the um, unrelenting movement of people, um, Black people, but also allies to ensure that Black lives matter. And, you know, um, as it relates to the work of ABFI, uh, first, let me also say that we are uh, celebrating our 50th anniversary this year. So there was something going on in 1970, 1971, as it relates to the organizing of black institutions, right, um, post civil rights era to continue to fight um, and to continue the work forward. Um, and because we're turning 50 this year, like so many organizations do when they hit these important milestones, you know, we reflect, um, do we need to continue? Is there a reason for us to sort of be in existence moving forward? And you know, it is so clear, uh, given what's going on in this country today, the disparities that exist for our community, for Black people in particular, uh, the disparities in philanthropy that this organization is very concerned about and really, um, really facilitated the founding of our organization, given where the resources were going of philanthropy and the extent to which we were getting our equitable share um, you know, we clearly believe that we've got another 50 years uh, ahead of us, and we want to do that in, in collaboration with organizations um, um, like yours. So um, in terms of, of APFI's work, our mission is to promote effective and responsive philanthropy in Black communities. And we've got um, ideas, we've got a framework on what we think effective and responsive philanthropy is, and we can talk about that as we delve deeper into the conversation. Um, we are a philanthropic partnership for black communities. Uh, we've got a national membership. Uh, we're just over about 950 people around the country. Um, and our members are primarily black professionals that work in foundations in the US, but we also have black led nonprofits in our membership. Because our work again is how do we promote responsive and effective philanthropy in black communities. And we don't think we can do that 
or get there just by foundation professionals talking to each other. We actually need to be talking with black led nonprofits that are receiving funds for the most part, right, from, from foundations. Um, so that's our membership. Um, our programming falls in three sort of broad areas to give you an overview. Um, one is philanthropic advising. Uh, we do direct advising, training, and coaching with foundation boards and staff about how to be more impactful in Black communities. And you all know um, philanthropy generally, it is a, uh, a sector that is not diverse, um, you know, in terms of people of color and Black people in particular leading. Um, and when we don't see the diversity in the sector, we also don't have the lived experience in foundations that we need to ensure that philanthropy is responsive to our communities. So our philanthropic advising work is really to uh, make grant making more effective, more impactful, um, and more understanding, quite frankly, of experiences that we face as a people. So that's sort of the first pillar of our work. The second is um, a broad sort of category of member and network services. Um, so we work very hard to bring together foundations, um, not just members of AFI, but foundations across the country uh, to uh, learn. Uh, we do a lot of grant maker education, professional development. Um, it is um, a, a tough uh, sort of lift uh, to uh, help support people who are overseeing billions of dollars, trillions of dollars of assets under management in philanthropy and don't have the true understanding about this country and about how black communities got to be the way they are. So our member and networking services is all about grant maker education, professional development and connecting people in more impactful ways so they can leverage dollars to be more strategic in black communities. And then the third sort of bucket of our work um, is research and advocacy. We stay on the issues of where the funding is going uh, in, in the sector, um, you know, the money that's explicitly targeted to black communities, which is relatively low um, and, and has been relatively low since the foundation, the uh, organization's founding. But we also see on the issues of who gets to lead, the issues of diversity in philanthropy as well. So those are our three sort of buckets of work, if you will. Yeah. No, I, I and, and thank you for sharing that with us because th those are important things and uh, the mission and the focus is important to local uh, leaders to be able to access you. And especially what I found when I happened years ago to have been a, a mayor was that I would find a uh, small, uh, minority owned, black owned foundations. They had a vision and a dream, but the infrastructure was always the big challenge. Yeah. Um, the IRS issues and, and, and we've seen those. So I can tell you, um, NBC Leo members reach out uh, to Susan and connect your, uh, your foundation, your local foundations, because man, that skill-based training um, is is very important to being successful as a foundation so thank you for that sure. i do appreciate that um let me um ask you guys uh, again just let's talk about this and i want to uh, we talk about the uh current and local economic landscape uh that exists in, in the black community um how has that changed uh since um mlk speech because a lot of times um, you know, we look at data and data, we look like, oh man, we've arrived, uh, Russell, uh, but data shows us something different. So let me start with you, Russell. What do you, how, ha, what, how has the landscape changed nationally as well as local economically in terms of landscape? Well, um, you, you hit on it, uh, Brother Anthony, in, in that, uh, I believe our net worth is now less than it was back in the 60s. Home ownership is, has it really increased? It may even be less than it was. I'm sure uh, Susan and her organization has, has those uh, statistics better. And I know uh, Leon would with Rio. Um, so to answer this, this 
uh, question straight on. Not much has changed and I think we've regressed. And it really hit me when I listened to Dr. King's speech when he talked about, you know, the economic disparities and police brutality in this season that we are right now, what we're dealing with. So economically, not much has changed. Um, you know, uh, we've there's been a lot of discussion and a lot of focus on the uh, uh, black wealth gap. Um, and I, you know, just so I'm not repetitive, uh, not much has changed. I think we've, I, matter of fact, I think we've even regressed some. Yeah, I, I, I would agree. Um, you know, our story in this country is always a story of progress and struggle, right? So since the, the, the speech, um, you know, while we may have seen increases in, um, you know, over time, um, you know, ownership, whether it's business ownership or uh, increases in income, clearly, um, and increases in home ownership, um, because of racism, right, um, we see retrenchment, most recently retrenchment. So there's always been disparities, regardless of where we were in terms of statistics and data as relates to our own wealth, right? There's always been dis disparities because of racism. Um, and uh, to your point, Russell, the racial wealth divide um, is even greater now. Um, given, you know, uh, again, I, I've just got to say racism writ large, um, but particularly since the 2008 recession, um, we lost so much ground uh, in 2008 in the economic downturn. Um, so while there was wide disparity, you know, um, nationally for our community, um, again, you know, over the course of, of, of time, uh, when pandemics happen and crises happen, we get hurt worse. We get disproportionately hit. And 2008 wiped out um, wealth in, in such a critical way for our communities that the racial wealth divide has now grown and, and still growing. The concern is, you know, what's gonna happen um, over the course of the next year or two, uh, given the disproportionate impact of COVID on our community. Yeah, I, I, I do think that that um, as we look at the data and the outcomes in terms of uh, the economic uh, landscape and COVID has been significant. Um, you know, we know the four times, three times um, to contract the disease and then the same three and four times death and uh, also, I, I think, you know, as we look at the business landscape, um, black businesses are being impacted. What are you guys seeing nationally uh, in regards to uh, uh, black Americans and, and black businesses? And, and Russell, you may wanna focus on that directly and to Akron, but Susan, let me start with you and then go to Russell. This is this is a huge concern for us and, and just to, you know, I think as we all know, um, ownership matters, right? When it when it comes to wealth, and so um, we are very interested and concerned about Black business ownership at Abbey because a lot of the data tells us that it's one of the most strategic ways to address the racial wealth divide in this country, right? Um, black business owners are wealthier than Blacks who earn their income through wage employment, for example. Um, business ownership actually grows wealth faster than wage employment. Um, black businesses hire black people at higher rates than other businesses. And so uh, it's absolutely essential um, that our businesses are strong um, and can sustain uh, you know, crises. And I think the data we have access to, and Russell, I might've seen it in your material as well, is that just the last year, we, we're looking at potentially 40% decline in Black businesses, the number of Black businesses yep. that have closed their doors. Um, so this is of grave concern. Um, and again, you know, uh, economists really point to um, scaling Black businesses um, being the most strategic and fastest way to grow the racial wealth divide, but we are digging out of a hole um, as it relates to uh, um, 
the pandemic and, and what happened in this country in 2020. And we can talk about payroll protection program and all the flaws there. Again, that we saw just the structural inequity um, as to why we're seeing such a decline um, in why we saw such a decline. I'm just concerned about, you know, the, the, hard, the, the hard period isn't over. We're not out of this yet. And um, this, is, this is a huge issue for us nationally. Russell, what are you seeing um, and hearing from your colleagues locally? Uh, the, the challenge is that uh, you, you mentioned it about small foundations. Most of our businesses may not have the infrastructure to get their paperwork in, in the proper order to apply for all of the assistance to uh, In our city and the county, they did a good job of trying to get it out. But the challenge was, again, having the the paperwork it, it, uh, properly uh, in line so that you could apply on, in a timely manner and having the technical support mm -hmm. to even get it in on, on time. So uh, of course, black businesses have been hit hard. Uh, uh, a lot of them uh, are ha uh, hanging on by a thread, um, uh, but the challenge is not, ha not having the, a lot of it is not having the, the technical support to be able to, take advantage of some of these things. No, I, I agree with that. I, you know, I, I think as, you know, as, as you, you really rightly said, uh, uh, Russell, it's interesting thinking back of being a, a business owner, you can only grow so far and you need additional training and infrastructure and investment to go to that next level. And then the pan pandemic comes in and it, you know, we close down uh, and the places that often are closed down and impacted most are those small and minority owned businesses. And um, then they have to ramp back up, right? And then the inability to get a loan because they wanna require more paperwork or we don't have the relationships. So there's so much piled on uh, to that uh, landscape of, of black business, black uh, foundations and local communities and nonprofits, I, I really think there's something uh, interesting that we need to probably dig into a, a, a little bit more. Um, let me ask you guys, how are you, uh, Susan, how are you dealing with that at AppFee? Is, is there something strategic that you guys are focusing on? And Russell, the same thing. What are you hearing from those local leaders to say, we have stood up something to help those black businesses or the other disparities. Susan, why don't we start with you? You know, yeah, um, I, I really appreciate Russell, the, the points about um, just not having the paperwork in order, the, the infrastructure, the support, the technical assistance. And one of the things that we've been doing from AbFi's vantage point is trying to get more resources in this moment colleagues to Black-led community development finance institutions, CDFIs, right? Um, there is actually an African-American association of CDFIs that are about 40 or 50 around the country that are specific, you know, um, and intentionally focusing on not just getting equity and capital but to Black businesses, but also providing that technical assistance, right? So it's really We've got to think about the ecosystem as they describe it, the ecosystem or the infrastructure of what we call building economic power in black communities. And it's more than just access to the capital and the equity, even though that's a huge barrier. It's all of these other things um, that we're talking about in terms of technical assistance and support. Um, I had a great conversation with someone from the National Bankers Association the other day, and they were talking about the important role that black banks actually paid, um, played as it relates to black businesses uh, around the country in this critical time. And we also know black banks are struggling. Um, we've got challenges with our banking institutions, but they were much more apt, right? To provide not only loans and resources through payroll protection, but that technical assistance, right? Um, that coaching and the like. So. Um, we're really trying to take a very broad view and look at what we're calling infrastructure to build political power in Black communities, right? So that includes Black businesses, that includes Black-led CDFIs that focus specifically on Black businesses, that includes Black banks, 
who again need additional resources and we're trying to sort of pull together some, some strategies around how foundations can help black banks in particular. Um, but, but just taking a, a, a broader view and, and really pushing the need for not just funding black businesses, but funding the infrastructure or the ecosystem that will support, you know, support their survival and sustainability over time. Yeah, I, th I think that that's very key. And, um, I, you know, one of the things, uh, you know, I want to make sure we give some specific things, um, as Susan has identified, and for you as well, Russell, uh, let's imagine you were uh, the CEO of the world, and you had an opportunity to come up with strategies and techniques and programs. What would you do to um, create, close this gap that we're seeing in the economics, whether it's business, housing, um, jobs, education, just any one of those areas. You are the CEO of the world. You're, you're the God of the world, if you will. Both of y'all, what, what, what would you say a local leader need to, needs to do? Now you only had that for two minutes, so you better take advantage of it. <laughs> I love it. Russell, you go first. I okay, well, thank you. <laughs> well, you know what? First, I've got to give credit to being a, a member of uh, the greatest constituency group on this planet, NBC Leo. And, right, and, I, and I just want to give credit to, you asked what would I do? Susan, one of the things we want to do is we want to form a strong network of collaboration and best practices. I'm proud to be a part of an organization where, uh, I'm just going to highlight some of them. Um, Members have worked in their communities. Uh, the one that, the flagship that we mentioned is an older woman out of Everson, Illinois, Robin Ruth Simmons. Uh, she worked with her uh, colleagues on council and, 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 and the community. They established this nation's first local reparations bill. Mm. When Illinois legalized marijuana, they said, wait a minute, you've been incarcerating our boys with this for the same thing. Now you're gonna make money off of it? They formed a $10 million local reparations bill for a city of less than 20,000 black folks. And they're gonna address housing, the gentrification from their community of housing. We have a council member from uh, Philadelphia, Derek Green. He's worked with his community to uh, create a, a public bank because um, they'll have more flexibility to invest and address these things with black businesses. Then we have a uh, council member, now mayor, uh, is it? Brandon Scott out of Baltimore. They created a community equity fund. And we've heard of Asheville, Illinois. And those are just a few. Uh, in, in my community, we reached up to Cleveland. Well, we, I think I shared this with you earlier. Well, we found out that uh, our two counties, Cuyahoga County and Summit County sued the pharmaceuticals and won a $330 million settlement. And then they divided the money by the population ratio. Cuyahoga County got uh, uh, 220 something million. Summit County where I, my city resides got 104. We said, wait a minute. Okay, well, what's, we're 15% we're of this community, the black community. There was none of this when crack cocaine was ravaging our community. And now that opiates here, we're talking about uh, equity. Just by using the same formula, 15% of that or $15 million should come directly to the black community. Now we haven't finished that conversation, but believe me, we're gonna have it. So brother uh, Clarence, without being long-winded, all I gotta do is look at our family to get some things. But this is the other thing. I do wanna say this, and I wanna use, because across the country, we're declaring racism a public health crisis. And some people say, well, what do you mean when you declare racism a public health crisis? Well, let's take racism out, let's put COVID there. What did the nation do? The first thing we did was we looked at our policies and practices that could be the catalyst for spreading COVID. Mm. We immediately addressed them and tried to change them and implement better policy. We need to do that with, with anything that uh, is a catalyst for creating these inequities that are associated with racism. The next thing we knew, we knew that there needed to be a direct infusion of cash, of stimulus dollars to help communities deal with this. We need to do the same thing with, uh, uh, address of racism. We have to have an honest discussion. And this is where I really appreciate what I gleaned from Rio. We have to do a 
uh, historical forensic analysis of the dis disproportionate impact of uh, policies and things that have happened to this nation that have uh, put us in this situation. I mean, this has been strategic. Uh, uh, one of the uh, things we got when we watched Rio was we don't talk about it. We know it, but let's bring it out of the future. We talk about opioids. Crack cocaine was brought into our community by the CIA. So we've got to we've got to have these conversations. So uh, you know, I'll, I'll I'll reel it back in. But this is this is why uh, Association of Black Foundation Executives is so critical to our work. Just like with COVID, when governors and mayors were doing their thing, and it, it was good, but they knew, they knew it wasn't enough to have our individual plans. We needed a national plan. We needed. Uh, this is where the Association of Black Foundation Executives come together. As a community of people, none of our legacy organizations, we don't have an organization that can address this. This is gonna take collective work from all of us. And to have an organization that knows how to manage the money, that knows how to have provide that, that, that professional oversight is gonna be critical when we have these real conversations that to bring the, the reparational, restitutional, and the reallocation of the annual budgets that should come to our community in, we could create and, and, and endow our communities. Well, you got you got the Holy Ghost there for a minute, Russell. Thank you. Oh, I'm loving Thank it. You. And I've got all sorts of. Uh, uh, come on, come I, on. I got excited. No, I got excited as Russell was talking. And so, wait, Clarence, I'm going to take you literally. Um, uh, if I was God, right? Wave the wand. Yeah. So, so let me start very. Let me start very. Um, uh, relevant to what we all just went through, I would do away with the Electoral College, <laughs> number mm -hmm. one, right? <laughs> okay. Um, I love the uh, the frame around reparations, and quite frankly, um, you know, we at AbFi are looking at ways in which philanthropy needs to be more engaged in the reparations movement. I think we have to go there. I think that um, you know, foundations, particularly over the last year. Um, have in fact stepped up their game. There's, there's at least more talk about, right? Um, racial equity, racial justice, white supremacy, um, you know, privilege and the like. And I think it actually has got to move to a frame around reparations to really sort of unleash the power of foundation endowments and what they can do for our communities and all communities who have been harmed by this country, um, you know, in terms of, uh, as you say, Russell, years and years of policies and practices that have disadvantaged Black people and advantaged white people, right? So I think we have to move to the reparations frame. And then the other thing I would do, um, and Russell, you hit on it. We were talking about it um, before we, we started the program this, this evening. Uh, I would look to endow organizations in our community that are really about building not just economic power, but political power in the United States, right? So again, given the election cycle that we just came through, um, the, the real issues of voter suppression, the, you know, the, the, the real issues blocking us from building political power in this country have to be dealt with. And we know that Black-led organizations, particularly grassroots organizations actually um, as we watched in Georgia, um, in other places around the country, can, can, can really make a difference in terms of um, civic engagement uh, and, and, um, uh, pol and building political power to literally, you know, sort of ensure that we can move policies that matter and undo some of the things that have been done to us as a community. So my third sort of magic wand moment would be to ensure that groups like um, Black Voters Matter, you know, based in Georgia, um, have the re and so many fair fights, so many other organizations have the resources they need to build uh, political power uh, for our community. No, those are those are godly type uh, uh, changes that you guys would make, and I think that's amazing and wonderful because I do think if we don't create a vision, if we don't create a dream and share those dreams with each other, we may not even try to address uh, some of the things that you feel like we need to address. And and clearly, uh, you know, dreaming about 
of focusing on the electoral college is something that's important. And, you know, investing in some of these nonprofits that focuses focusing on voting and empowerment is very key. I guess I want to try to make the connection between um, the two things that you guys talked about, the local government godly dream and then the foundation dream. So how, how do you see local governments and foundations working together to address these disparities? Either one of y'all, just jump in. Y'all God now, so just. <laughs> I, gave, um, I gave you another minute of godliness, go ahead. Well, I, I'll just share from, from uh, uh, what I, what I see in some of the challenges. Um, again, we're dealing with structural and institutional racism. Um, and there have been some good programs, some good initiatives. Every city is starting a task force. Um, but to address this, we have to institutionalize our work. And so the, the, the thing that I see is that one, uh, as leaders, uh, elected leaders, we have to lead in this conversation. Because if we're not uh, careful in our communities, the discussion will turn from racism and it will go to equity, diversity, and inclusion. It will go to um, uh, people of color. Everything except for dealing with the disparities that were directly and policies directly put in place to uh, harm black people. So we've got to deal with, with this thing about race. And I, I shared this in one discussion. Please excuse me, I gotta say it here. Uh, was listening to NPR radio and uh, they were interviewing a leader for the Latino community. This was eight days after uh, President Biden's uh, uh, terms in office. And they asked him, what did they think? Uh, how is he doing? And, and a Latino leader said, he's doing a good job but I believe he needs to address uh, structural and institutional racism and the impacts of Jim Crow laws on the black community. A Latino leader said this, mm -hmm. and he said, because, and they need to address it now, because if they don't, one day this nation will wake up and it will be speaking a different language. Mm -hmm. What was he saying? He acknowledged that the, the injustices of this country against black people, but he also wanted us to understand the clock is ticking because there's a whole lot of other people standing behind us that need their issues addressed. And so that's why it's more critical for us as leaders to understand that this is not a NBC Leo thing or ABF thing or the legacy organizations like uh, uh, NACP or Urban League or, or any of those. It's all of us together. We've got to come up with a community plan that will sustain this work for futures to come because I do not think that this window of opportunity will come around again in our lifetime. It's critical. I agree. I appreciate that. And, and you know, to the question about how foundations and local government can work together. I mean, I, I think there are so many, I think there are models and examples that actually um, now that we're in this conversation, I want us at ABFI to start chronicling. And I think Russell and Clarence maybe doing that um, will just give us more sort of, you know, ways to lift up uh, what have been strategic, what are strategic relationships, you know, um, around the country where philanthropy and local, you know, elected officials are working together. Um, one of the things that, that is important um, for um, electeds to know is that foundations often see their resources as um, short money, not long money, right? And, and I'm not sharing anything with you that's sort of rocket science as catalytic um, and not necessarily investments for the long term, which to your point, Russell, why we've got to build our own endowment models, quite frankly, for our community because many of the foundations, there are over 80,000 foundations in this country, right? Ranging from the very big ones, right? To smaller local community foundations, but they see their resources as catalytic to actually trigger public dollars, right? Um, the, the, the belief that, that the real money is in the public coffers. And so 
how we develop our relationships, um, you know, is something that we've just got to take into account about how many foundations see their money being used. Um, but, but I think there's so many uh, ways um, that um, local government and philanthropy can work together on issues um, to address anti-Black racism. Uh, one is doing the research, continuing to do the research on disparities across all issue areas, right? Philanthropy can support that. Um, other is engaging community, Black communities in the thinking through of that research, in the collection of that research, right? Everything that we sort of lift up in terms of best practice for foundations in this country has an element of engaging Black people. You can't do you know, responsive philanthropy in Black communities without engaging Black people in the process. Um, we actually, I think someone mentioned historical analysis. That was you, Russell. Um, you know, we are often amazed, shouldn't be, but often amazed about how foundation partners, let me just say in Chicago, don't understand the backstory about how the South Side of Chicago got to look like the South Side of Chicago or I'm right outside of Washington, DC, how Anacostia, east of the Anacostia River, actually got to be Anacostia. When, when Michael Brown was killed in Ferguson um, in 2014, we were called in, uh, not by philanthropy, but by community, right? To come talk to philanthropy about how Ferguson, a suburb of St. Louis, you know, at one point being predominantly white, 10 years later was predominantly black failing schools and over-policed, right? So we call it creating the backstories to the inequity that our communities face. Foundation money can be used to create these backstories, right? To, for, for sort of lifting up sort of how these disparities came to be. And then also I'll just end with, um, I, I think there are tools, racial equity impact analysis tools, for example, that help um, government look at what might be the consequences of different policies, right? On black people, on Latinx people, on white people. Um, philanthropy can fund those things and, and actually are funding those kinds of analyses around the country. So there's, there's a lot that we can do together and we, we just need to make it happen, yeah. So we have a few more minutes and I'm gonna throw you guys a, a question uh, that I'm just interested in learning uh, from you. Um, you know, this is a, a wokeness time on racial equity in America. And I know we have to seize on, on this opportunity, but in your life, who has been your hero or shero that has made such a significant change um, such that we're talking about? And I don't want y'all to go to, like when I, again, was mayor, we would have this Martin Luther King oratorical contest I have a dream and all that, yeah. No, I want you to dig deep and just tell me. Now, Russ, I'm gonna start with you because I know you better and I'm gonna give Susan a minute. Well, well you know, it, it's like when we had a chance to, to just uh, chat not too long ago. I'm fortunate to come from such a rich community. Um, my family, uh, my father, uh, uncles coming from a traditional black church being blessed to be born in the 60s and the conversations that were around the community. So the, the just that air, that village is still to me, uh, you know, just a love for community and an understanding of my responsibility to my community. Um, so uh, I have to say the village, not trying to take an easy way out, but it's, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm fortunate to come from a, from a true village that, that has influenced me. Okay. You know, next time we have this conversation, I'm going to dig deeper than that, but go ahead. <laughs> what are you, what, what are you I was talking, Russell, we, it is so good that we met. I was talking about the village earlier, matter of fact, um, and uh, how I was fortunate growing up in Long Island, New York. My parents, you know, my family was, was part of the village. Um, and so, uh, you know, you got, you got to, to talk about that. You know, I have to think of, um, there's so many folks, Clarence, but I guess I'm really sort of thinking about Ambassador James A. Joseph today, um, who um, was the founding board chair of our organization at ABFI, um, uh, went on to become um, ambassador to South Africa 
under um, President Carter, but what he did in this sector, the, the, the fact that colleagues, we have uh, black people sitting in the CEO suites of the Ford Foundation right now, the W.K. Kellogg Foundation right now, the Andrew Mellon Foundation right now, the Open Society Foundation. We have more Black Foundation CEOs right now, which is why we got to seize this moment, than we've ever seen in this sector. And a lot of that has to do with the boldness and the courage of Ambassador James Joseph, who um, led a protest at the Council of Foundations meeting in 1971, the council being the big sort of umbrella organization of philanthropy in this country, led a protest, stormed the stage and demanded black people be voted on to the board of an all white institution. Um, and that led to the early gains of diversity in the sector. Um, He's in Sarasota, Florida right now, um, and he is uh, struggling, challenged a bit health-wise, um, but uh, clearly is one of my heroes. So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to name him. Yeah. And guess what? Um, homework for everybody. We're going to uh, look up uh, Ambassador Jacobs, and we're going to- James, James Joseph. James Joseph. James Joseph. Yes. Jacobs. Yes. Uh -huh. And we're going to learn about him because I do think that that's the, um, as we began this conversation, we, we talk about, um, I have a dream, you know, and we often uh, cite uh, Dr. King in the summer of 1963, but gosh, there's so many others uh, that I learn about every day, not just in February, but 365 days days a year, as Tom Joyner would say. And I, I, I get more inspired. So, you know, I have a mission uh, with the National League of Cities uh, to make sure that, you know, our membership address the tough issues. You know, I have a passion that is driven because of my life and meeting you guys that we can even do more and I am more motivated. I have a motivated vision that um, NBC Leo, the 50 years is gonna partner more with you, Susan, uh, because there's so much connectivity about the founding, the mission, uh, the vision, and most importantly, um, the need in our communities nationally. So I cannot thank both of you enough uh, for spending uh, this hour with us uh, we had a number of Black elected officials, and there were some questions uh, in uh, the chat box that many of you addressed uh, through your answers. Um, I see folks uh, out of Denver just uh, salivating to, to connect with each of you, wanting to learn more about how they can um, develop their communities, engage their communities. And so most of all, I just want to say happy Black History Month. Um, excited about the next 50 years for both of our organizations. And uh, as uh, I often say, I love you and you don't have, you, you, you can't have anything to do but accept it. So I'm just so excited. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you guys. Y'all have a good night. And thanks all of you for uh, participating. It was wonderful.